In this final unit of the semester, unit four takes us to ecology and evolution. Once again, learning objectives. In 1859, while Mendel was sowing pea plants in Brno, Charles Darwin celebrated his 50th birthday and also published a book. Not his first one. He was a known author since writing his travelogue, Voyage of the Beagle. His 1859 book was titled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. For the rest of this lecture, I shall refer to it simply as Origin of Species, or even just Origin. And to head off any misunderstandings, Darwin says nothing about human evolution in this book. But still, the book was rather controversial because he framed the unity and diversity of life in a new way. Not completely new, as we will see, but what Darwin did was present a mechanism supported by data and a synthesis of correspondence from dozens of scientists. In Origin of Species, Darwin put forth the idea that species of today are descended from the species of the ancient past. He used the phrase descent with modification several times, but the word evolution, not at all. Evolution is both a noun and a verb. Biologists view evolution as both an observable pattern in the history of life on Earth, as well as a process that we can see happening today. Darwin's ideas were revolutionary, but timely. During the mid-19th century, the age of exploration was advanced, the scientific revolution was at full tilt, the industrial age was burgeoning. All these advances were instrumental in forming the world around Charles Darwin and feeding his ideas. The first chapter of Origin documents years of communications with other scientists, asking questions related to this mystery of mysteries, as has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. That last bit is a quote by Darwin referring to John Herschel. Prior to Darwin, a number of other eminent thinkers were laying the groundwork in a number of related disciplines. In this section, I will review some of these ideas related to diversity. The dates here are not important in the sense that you should memorize them so much as you should try and put all of the characters and their ideas into Darwin's timeline. People had been curious about the diversity of life on Earth since ancient times. Some of the earliest ideas about Earth's diversity included the writings of Aristotle. Aristotle proposed that all living things could be arranged in a natural order, with animals like worms and insects on the lower rungs of the ladder and the top rungs occupied by humans and demigods and gods on the rungs above us. In the Old Testament of the Bible, the different types of living things were specifically and perfectly created during the week of creation and that change is not possible. Fast forward to the 18th century in Sweden. A man named Carl von Linné saw the great diversity of life around him and from around the world as explorers brought samples of the world's biodiversity back to Europe. He saw patterns and similarities in living things which he attributed to the creator's perfect design, and he sought to categorize life on Earth in an orderly manner. Being a scholar, he gave all things names based on the languages of science at the time, Latin and Greek including himself. Carl von Linné, the Swede, rebranded himself as Carolus Linnaeus. Today, he is remembered for developing the science of taxonomy or naming of life. The hierarchy of organisms into phyla, classes, orders, families, genera, and species, that was his idea. Every named group of organisms, or taxon, requires a formal written description that identify the taxon as distinct from its close relatives. He described thousands of species, and many still bear his authorship. For a first approximation, he did quite well, though many of his classifications are known to be inaccurate today. For example, he defined two kingdoms of life on Earth, animals and plants. Fungi he considered to be plants that weren't green, because, like true plants, 
They grow out of the ground and they don't have moving parts. Today, we recognize that fungi are not plants at all and that fungi share more recent common ancestry with animals rather than plants, which is something you'll learn much more about if you take organismal biology. Another of his unfortunate classifications was to place humanity into four distinct races. As with fungi and plants, this particular classification did not bear up to the rigors of peer review and overwhelming data. Linnaeus also devised the system of binomial nomenclature. All species have two-part names, indicating the genus and the specific epithet, italicized and capitalized. Even if there is only one species in the genus, as is currently the case with Homo sapiens, we have a two-part name. Tigers are of the species Panthera tigris, along with Panthera leo, lions, and others of the so-called big cats. Notice how both of these names are followed by the capital letter L. This indicates that they were both described or formally written up by Linnaeus himself. This is a very commonly found picture of Linnaeus, although it should be noted that this is not what he would wear in, on a daily basis. This is actually him dressing up as a Laplander. This is a bit like me showing up to class wearing a full cowboy outfit with a 10-gallon hat and chaps and six guns and spurs. Most of the time, he looked more like this. At this point in the story, the late 1700s, the prevailing idea was that the Earth was an eternal but somehow static place. And by eternal, a commonly calculated age for the planet was around 6,000 years old. However, as the 1700s turned into the 1800s and the demands of the industrial age for energy increased, most of that energy was found in coal, and knowing where to find coal became very valuable information. This turned into a great boom in the field of digging because that is how coal is found. And mixed in with all that dirt and rock and coal, fossils. So, in addition to the exponential increase in our knowledge of the world's biodiversity in the present, came an exponential increase in our knowledge of the world's ancient biodiversity via these fossils. These fossils weren't just collateral damage from the hunt for, for coal and other buried resources. They were invaluable clues for how to find that black gold and the birth of the science of stratigraphy or understanding strata. Strata are layers of sedimentary rock. Layers of sedimentary rock form as mass wasting, the breakdown of other forms of rock, washes downstream and settles out. In addition to the sediment, remains of living things get caught in the sediment and living tissue. One of the first principles of stratigraphy is the law of superposition, which is a fancy way of saying the older sediment is put down before the newer sediment. Superposition works like this. Here is a stack of papers. Which papers were put in the stack first? Assuming that the stack was put down organically, the first papers are the ones on the bottom, and the most recent papers on the top, because the papers on top couldn't just hover without papers underneath them supporting them. Oldest paper on the bottom, newer as we add to the stack, and the newest papers on top. That's the law of superposition. Pretty simple really, but also quite effective in understanding geological strata. Stratigraphers also began to notice that the types of fossils found in different strata followed certain patterns as well, such as older fossils were deposited with older strata and younger fossils in more recent strata. These data were also inconsistent with the previous hypothesis of a worldwide Noachian flood. Alabama is an amazingly diverse state, biologically and geologically, and those two facts are linked. This colorful map on the left shows the many geological units of the state. I have included an inset of just Lee County, where we find ourselves, which is at the nexus of two very different geological formations. I can reduce it very simply to two broad categories, old rocks and very old rocks. How old are they? The old rocks are dated at about 100 million years old, 
and the very old rocks are older than 250 million years old. And just for reference, Auburn's campus is right about here. War Eagle, y'all. Right at the junction of two very different types of ground along what is known as the fall line. This knowledge informed another nascent scientific study, paleontology or the study of fossils. The scientist called the father of paleontology was Georges Cuvier, who you might guess was French. Cuvier looked at the geological evidence and proposed catastrophism, the idea that the boundaries between strata represented a biblical catastrophe such as a major flood. Catastrophism also helped to explain another idea that seemed impossible in a perfectly created biosphere, extinction. As more and more of the world's living diversity was being discovered, and many, many more types of fossils that match no living organisms, the controversial proposition that species might go extinct was ever more difficult to deny. Another science that was developing was geology, which includes stratigraphy and meets biology through paleontology. James Hutton is considered to be the father of geology, and he wrote the first major work in the field, Theory of the Earth, colon, blah, 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 kind of like Darwin's book was on the origin of species, blah, blah, blah. Seriously, were these guys getting paid by the word? Any hizzo. Hutton's book was brilliant, at least I'm pretty sure it was, because Hutton was not the most transparent author. One of the few people who really understood it was Charles Lyell, who wrote his own version called Principles of Geology, which was kind of like geology for dummies in the 19th century terms. Darwin was one such dummy who read Lyell's book and was influenced by it. Both Hutton and Lyell proposed an ancient earth, much older than 6,000 years, hundreds of millions of years or more, but exactly how old they did not know. They proposed uniformitarianism in contrast to catastrophism. Their view was that the same geological processes happening and observable today have happened throughout the span of Earth's history. Flooding, volcanism, earthquakes, glaciation, shifting river channels, mass wasting, all of it. And these views had a profound influence on Darwin. Lyle and Darwin's were contemporaries, and they did communicate. Another influencer before Instagram was Thomas Malthus, who was a clergyman and scholar. Malthus wrote an essay on the principle of population, which suggested that human populations are capable of geometric, or curved, growth, while production of food and other essential resources is only capable of arithmetic, or straight line growth. This being the case, when the lines met, catastrophe will ensue in the form of famine, war, disease, and other terrible fates. Darwin saw this and said, if so for human populations, how not so for natural populations? And finally, before we get to Darwin himself, one more influence on Darwin, another Frenchman named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck was a brilliant natural historian, but today his name has become synonymous with an inferior hypothesis of evolution. Lamarck was one of the first scientists to suggest that living things might change through time. This was an intellectually revolutionary idea. The mechanism he proposed was that acquired characters, things that happened to parents through their lifetimes, might influence the inheritance of the offspring and that use and disuse of structures contribute to the phenotype of the offspring. While he had this idea, the mechanism he proposed lacked evidence. Fast forward 200 years in the genomic age, and we see that maybe there is a kernel of evidentiary support for Lamarckian evolution. A new field of genetic study called epigenetics seems to be resurrecting some of Lamarck's vision for evolution, though to what extent? <laughs> 